So we're, once again, with Gary Collins here. And Gary, I know you've worked with a lot of people. You've got a lot of knowledge from many different sources. What are some of the things you would do in working with a, a beginner? Um, the most basic thing I do is I, we were talking about the supplements, the kind of uh, fundamentals of the basic supplements. And I would get them on a package like that. So I'll have them on, get them on vitamin D, fish oil, a uh, good multi, uh, the turmeric for inflammation, and then also uh, possibly a probiotic if they have a lot of digestive issues, which almost everyone does. Yes. And then also I'll use protein powders as well. And the reason I use these is I use those as meal substitutes in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I usually use it for lunch. Um, I, I like to start people out slow who haven't done anything in a long time. They've been eating the standard American diet, don't know anything about exercise. So I tell them they need to start walking. Before I work with them one-on-one uh, -on -one far as exercise, I say, hey, you got to go out and at least give me 30 minutes a night for two weeks walking. And they kind of give you that look like, well, that's not like P90X or anything. How am I going to get ripped and all that? I'm like, yeah. no, no, that's not what this is about. You need to get the blood moving. You know, you need to get some of those nutrients flowing through your body. We need to get some oxygen to your brain. You just need to get your joints prepared for movement. Yes. So what we're doing with walking is starting that process. And then with the supplements, we're trying to take out the inflammation, help take out the chronic inflammation. And then I tell them diet-wise, I'm like, okay, let's start off by removing all the processed carbohydrates and start off by moving, or most of it, removing 25 to 50% of the sugars they're ingesting. So I kind of taper, taper the people who I know are going to struggle. And yes. so I try and taper them off. So I'm all, okay, look at what you put in your coffee or your tea. Well, if you're putting in two teaspoons of sugar, four, whatever, usually it's a lot more. It's usually like three or four. And I tell them, okay, now you need to cut that in half. So cut that in half. Um, if you're eating you know, a certain amount of bread items or grains during the day, let's cut that in half. And so they have to negotiate now. Now they're starting to have to negotiate their macronutrients. And they go, okay, I know I can have a sandwich for lunch. And I know the purists will go nutty on all this because they want, no, you stop right now. You go 30 days, hardcore. And it just doesn't work with a lot of people. I just mm -hmm. haven't found that technique works really well. So I tell them, you know, maybe for, you know, one day for one meal, you get to have bread, a bread item or a grain item. Well, for lunch, what I like to do is I like to substitute in a protein shake. And what that does is it cuts down a lot of the calories that they usually consume at lunch, and it also takes out the grains. So they can make, you know, with almond butter, a couple scoops of almond butter, you know, a half banana so they're not getting a ton of sugar, and, you know, one to two scoops of a good high-quality protein powder, whey, egg. We actually, I sell beef as well. Um, and mix that together with either a little stevia, you know, for sweetener if they need a little extra, and use coconut or almond milk, but use not the sweetened version. You know, don't right. use the sugar-loaded version, which a lot of them are. Yes. And it's amazing. Just off that, I can get people to lose, if they're anywhere from 50 pounds overweight or more, they'll lose five pounds in the first week. And they're pretty shocked by just a simple change like that, that they can drop that much weight. Um, and that's where I usually take them. Like I said, it's a slow progression. So I slowly start taking out, eliminating these toxic foods. It's all of the processed carbs. So your bagels, bread, you know, your English muffins, your cereals. The cereal, I don't know about you, the cereals is the toughest one for people with me. They love, and I was addicted, they love their cereal in the morning. Oh, yeah. And try to get someone to realize that a big bowl of oatmeal is not the way to start your morning. It is one of the worst ways to start your morning. Because it's full of, you know, very, it's even though it's a complex carbohydrate, oatmeal tends to digest uh, and turn into sugar fairly quickly. Sure. And then they're throwing in, then they're throwing in, you know, a couple of teaspoons of sugar or honey or maple syrup. Mm. And they basically have made this huge carb sugar bomb. Yes. You know, so then instead of their cortisol levels going down as they naturally do, you know, they peak in the morning and then they slowly taper off. Well, you get your peak. And then you hit it again with this high carbohydrate, high sugar, and it peaks up again. So it takes off again because that's what cortisol will do is if, if you eat a lot of sugar, cortisol levels rise too. Sure. Um, and so they kind of get that and go, okay, if your cortisol levels are high, your insulin levels are high, well, guess what you're going to do? You're going to store body fat and cortisol is very well known for storing it around your belly. 
that's where it likes to store fat when cortisol levels are high. And they're like, oh, okay. So if I can get them on that path and get them right away, they notice within 7 to 14 days a pretty drastic difference. And from there, it's just like a progression. You know, it's a one-on-one. -on -one. When I'm working one-on-one -on -one with a person, it's a lot different than if they have my books. Sure. Because, you know, it's this one-on-one -on -one communication, even though I speak uh, – uh, a lot of first person in my books instead of third person. I like to do that. I like to talk to people so they hear my voice in my books. Right. And But it just to tell them that depending, you know, we'll start there and then we can continue to remove the sugars out. I like to get it all out within the 30 days if I can. But people struggle with it. The sugars find their way in and they're not real educated on what foods are healthy. They'll go get Greek yogurt. And then they, they'll load it with a bunch of, you know, sweeteners and you're like, no, 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 you want the plain, you know, don't buy a Yoplait, don't buy, you know, this heavy processed sugar loaded stuff or artificial sweeteners. So there's a lot of education that goes into it, but I think by removing the highly processed carbohydrates and sugars right away, that's a huge, huge step. They feel better almost immediately once they get past the little sugar detox because I also tell people... Sugar's an addictive, it works at, just like an addictive drug. Yeah, uh, The no chemicals question. that are stimulated, yeah, the, in the, in the, the, the brain. It's the hypocampus and the, you yep. get the dopamine surge and, uh, yeah. Yes, and it's very highly addictive and we're getting it, mainlining it. You know, table sugar, it, you can't find that in nature. You know, to get one Coke is eight linear feet of sugar cane. You would have to chew on eight linear feet to get oh, the same amount that, of sugar. I didn't know that, fa that fact. I knew that, you know, we had yeah. eight to ten yeah, teaspoons so of sugar. Luck. So it's eight feet of sugar cane. Eight oh, feet. Oh, that's of great. I'm going to put that one in my yeah. notes. I'm going to steal that from you. <laughs> no problem. No problem. And, and so people start to realize. So the biggest thing is to educate them on sugar. Right. Uh, yeah, I and love once that graphic image, though. Eight feet of sugar cane in a, in a standard Coke. Yeah, well, not only that, but uh, I also give them an example. I go, if you have table sugar, you know, usually everyone has a bag of sugar now. Sure. I go, go home and take 43 teaspoons of sugar and put it in a bowl. I go, that's what the average American ingests in sugar every single day. Right. And they look at it and they go, no. And then I have an example in my book where I break down the food items to get to 43 teaspoons of sugar. And there's a granola bar in there. There's some Gatorade, applesauce, and everyone thinks, "Oh, those are those are super healthy." And I go, "Exactly. That's what you think because yeah, that's what you told." But that stuff adds up, and throughout a day, you can easily get into uh, a sugar coma, basically. Because if you were to eat all that sugar in one sitting, two things will happen: you either become very, very, very sick, you know, as in vomiting, headache, sweating heart palpitations, or you'll go into a coma. I mean, those are the results of eating that much sugar at one time. But we're just spreading this toxic element out over an entire day. So we don't have, you know, the catastrophic effect at one time. Right. We, we just have have spread it out. Well, yeah, we slowly like to kill the organism. Yeah, uh, it's the chronic effect. Yeah, yeah. So I have them do that, and they look at it, and they kind of go, wow, that's a lot of sugar. And the, I don't know about you, but I always get this. But that's not me. I yeah. don't do. I don't eat that much sugar. And I go, all right, let's get a meal log out. You're gonna take a meal log. And we're gonna do it for a week, and I'll tell you, there's a chance you might be ingesting more sugar than that. You know, especially the people who drink three, four cokes a day. Oh yeah, it's so easy to get. Uh... You know, there's ten tees or what is it? Uh, ten teaspoons of sugar in each coke. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's a normal coke, and that's not counting the big gulp. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, or the you know they think, oh well, I'll just have a you know a glass of juice in the morning, and most of those have up to you know anywhere from four to ten tables teaspoons oh, yeah. of sugar in those as well. Yeah, it's another, easy to get forty fifty grams of sugar in juice as well. Sure, that's those you know that's I find that that whole the pseudo health food stuff is one of the worst things because. You can go in into you know with the greatest intention in the world, and uh, I've I've seen friends and family members and, and customers of mine do the same thing and go in, go into this you know you go into the you end up in the diet aisle of the of your supermarket, <laughs> and you start ro loading up your cart, and on top of it you're paying more right, and oh, uh, yeah. and then it's just loaded it's all this you know all this 
all these other types of sugars. I think I've, I've got a blog post that has a, uh, a small sample. I think it's at least 50 different words that the food industry has come up with to disguise. Uh, it's kind of the stealth, like I called it the stealth sugar um, <laughs> report or something. And so it's all this stuff in there. And if you and I have, who are so, sort of deeply into this, uh, would have trouble deciphering all of this, all the ingredients. So what does the yeah. average person you know, they just, they look at the, they look at the, uh, I try to teach my people, hey, look at the label. The label is the advertisement. You know, when you see yep. the, the beautiful little stream, you know, the idyllic stream and the sunlight, all the natural. sun, all natural, <laughs> and the hill and the, you know, that's, you probably want to go the other direction, you know, go to the outside aisles and, you know, get the stuff that's got, that's, that's actually real food. What well, and I teach them too is not to focus on organics right away. And people think that's kind of crazy, but I go, again, you overwhelm them. Yes. I mean, trying to decipher a normal food, today's food, from an organic food and what ones are good and which ones are bad, that's a whole education upon itself. And I tell them, shop for the right foods first. You know, shop on the outside of your grocery store. And I also recommend they go to smaller grocery stores. Mm -hmm. Go to the healthy grocery stores and they go, well, they're so small, there's not much in there. I go, well, you don't need 48,000 items to be healthy. That's the average grocery store in America right. is 48,000 items. It would take you 125 years or more than 125 years to eat each item in a grocery store. Just one, yeah, if you ate one item a day, it would take you over 125 years. So, I mean, I try, try and get their perspective of is you want a small store because that makes it easier to shop. You know that if you get a healthy place, I'm lucky here we have a great chain that was created here in San Diego. And I walk in and it's like a fourth, if not a fifth of the size of a normal grocery store. Right. And it's all healthy. For the most part, there's all healthy items. But, you know, you got some stuff in there that you shouldn't probably eat. But that's another step is now you got to take that next step after you figure out organics and then go, okay, what is a healthy food? Am I still – it's organic, but is it truly good for me? I mean, if it's loaded with natural sugars, that's not good either. I mean sure. – yeah, so it, 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 I tell people it's tricky, so take your time. Don't try and overwhelm yourself and make too many changes at once. And also because you don't know what your food allergies and intolerances are. So if you change your, all your foods wholeheartedly and all of a sudden you don't feel good, well, it's probably because you're reacting to a food that you either, either have an intolerance or allergy to. Well, now you've got to figure out which one it is. So right. now you've got to eliminate all these foods that you just put in. I did that. I, I learned a valuable lesson. It took me six months to figure out the one item, and it ended up being a, a natural toothpaste. Oh, really? That was messing me up. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And I didn't know it, and I went through everything. I had to eliminate because I made all these changes all at one time, and I kept getting these bad sinus infections and couldn't figure out what was going on, and it ended up being I had an allergy to an ingredient in a natural toothpaste. Wow. That's, uh, that's the yeah. first time I heard that one. but. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dead, that's you know, what I mean. it's, it's yeah. Well, that's another yeah. example of uh, you know the the mouth. It's it's very important what goes in our mouth, whether it's uh, food or whether it's uh, you know food, drink, or even toothpaste or even dental fillings. You know. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, and, and that's what I tell people. This is uh, the easiest one of my. I have five principles in my Primal Power Method philosophy, and one of them is knowledge is power. That is actually number one. Yeah. If you don't understand what you're trying to do, the information is worthless. Um, and what you're doing is pretty much worthless because now you're just following a path that you don't understand. So how are you going to make rational decisions, educated decisions, if you don't understand it? So you have to at least educate yourself on food, on exercise. Do you have to be an expert? No. But you have to understand the basics. And that's what I try and teach them. I go, I just want to teach you the basics. You don't, I don't want to make you into a biochemist or anything like that. I sure. want you to understand why you shouldn't be eating so many carbohydrates, why you shouldn't be eating so many refined foods and talk about it and give them the list and the ingredients and talk about you know the fillers in foods today. So I try and give them uh, basically a, a nutrition and exercise 101 and to get them started. And once they get the concepts, everything else becomes easier and I've noticed by making my book short and concise they can read my books in three or four days and they're, right. then they can go, okay, I can apply this now. If you have a four or five hundred page book, you have to read it like four or five times, 
in order to get the knowledge and try and apply it, and now you're months down the road trying to figure sure. it out. And most people, frankly, so, probably don't get through the four and five hundred no. page book. I mean, how many up? You know, I've got four or five hundred pages books right here, and you know, there's very few of them that uh, that I'm actually going to get through. I mean, use them as a reference. And uh, exactly. You know, you know, and what they'll do is they'll pick. I've noticed that the average person will pick the book, pick it apart. They go sure. to the sections they like. So my attitude is, if I make it short, they should be able to get through the whole book and not have to pick through it. Um, so it's you know a lot of it is also psychological. As far as you don't like I said it's it comes down to overwhelming. Sure. And I tell people though if you're looking for the easy route in health and exercise or nutrition, there is no easy route. You have to go through changes that are going to be difficult. You're going to have to uh, face social pressures of family friends who are going to try and sabotage what you're trying to do. You know it, there's so many aspects that go into it. So you have to be ready to make the change. And any client I take on one on one, I ask them, I go, why are you here? That's my very first question. And so, if they go, yeah. well, I want to be here for my family, you know, I don't want to, you know, for my kids. And you know what I tell them? I go, you're here for the wrong reason. And they go, what do you mean? I go, if you're not here for yourself first, I honestly can't help you. And I call it, um, oh gosh, I had a special term I called for it. Uh, but it's basically deflecting your responsibility upon someone else instead of yourself. Right. Because now when you fail, it's not on you because you're not doing it for you. You're doing yeah. it for someone else, so it's not a big deal. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, it's, it's kind of bad. But you know, when you put all the pressure upon yourself and say, I failed me, that has much more meaning than it does if you put it on someone else. Uh, I call it, what I call it? Deflective. Oh God, I had a term for it, deflected responsibility or something like that. Right. And, uh, and, and instead, I tell people, you have to want to do this for yourself and you have to take responsibility for it. If you don't, you have a 99% chance of failure every single time. I've seen it time and time again. So yeah, and, and they're, they're pretty surprised when I tell them, if you're not ready, I won't even take you on. And yeah, they go, what, what do you mean? You're saying no? And I go, yeah. I don't. I, I've got other people to help. I don't need to help someone who's not fully invested. Yeah, that's, I think a, that's, that's, that's a great point. I mean, if uh, I like, I, I think we're pretty similar on this. My uh, my big thing is uh, why to before how to. Yeah. And the why to, if you've got a strong enough why to, then you'll then the how to is easy. And, yeah. And if you and then um, conversely, if your why to sucks, if your why to is weak. Then it doesn't really matter what I tell you to do because it's yeah. not going to work. You know, you've got no, no motor going. You've got you don't have the motivational engine going, and the engine's got to be some. And a lot of times, I think what you're talking about also, it just occurred to me that that the, um, it's just a lot of people aren't honest with themselves. You know, no. it's it's not like one of the things that uh, I've got a couple of uh, a couple of customers of mine who are divorced guys. And uh, it's taken me a while to, they're friends of mine, which is also another part of the problem. And I'm like, listen, you know, if you can't tell me that you want to date a younger, hot woman, if that's not moving to you, you know, that's okay. But, you know, you're not going to, you can't do it because you want to see, you know, your grandkids and you don't even have any kids, you know, or your, you know, <laughs> you know, just be freaking honest with yourself, you know. Uh, well, there's no, that's that's primal, a, isn't it? <laughs> Well, and that's why, uh, you know, everything I call my, you know, everything's primal power method. And I talk about primal because primal is different than paleo in the sense paleo is, pers is the diet. Yes. Primarily a diet portion. Primal is a lifestyle. So in a lot of the things I talk about, it's not just about, uh, you know, nutrition and exercise. It's about your whole lifestyle. I mean, what, what is toxic in your life? I mean, I can fix the nutrition and exercise portion and that's fine but if your life is still toxic it's only going to have a, you know it's not going to have the full effect it's going to have a small effect I mean if you're not sleeping if you're stressed out you hate your wife you hate your kids you hate your husband you hate your job you hate driving in traffic that stuff isn't going to help you very much I mean it will be better you'll be able to cope with things a little bit better but you have to look at your whole life and go okay what do I want Yes. And that's the problem in society today is we're confused on not only what we are but who we are. And a lot of people feel like they're just lost. And I go and that's the part when you work with people one on one, you end up 
being a psychologist almost yes. because you're dealing with so many issues outside of just their health as far as yes. nutrition and exercise. There's so many things going on and I tell them, I go, if you can't fix the things at home and your life and make yourself happy, we're fighting a huge uphill battle. And they're also, what do I do? And I go, ah, you know, I'm all, well, explain to me what is your major problem? I mean, do you hate your job? And they go, yes. I go, what can you do to fix that? You have to start thinking of all these as separate parts that come together. Can you go and get a different job? And they go, yes. I go, well, why don't you try and do that? Solve the problem. And with the nutrition and exercise, it does help you have better uh, problem-solving abilities. Yes. And cognitive function, as you know, that is one of the biggest things is people always tell me, they go, oh my God, I can think more clearly. I'm making much better decisions. So that will help them too. Um, so everything kind of falls in place, but then they actually have the ability to change from that job because they go, okay, now I get it. You know, it isn't, if I have a, uh, you know, if I don't like my job, what's the point? You know what I mean? If you have all these things in your life that you don't like and are toxic, well, what are you doing? Sure. You know what I mean? I mean, there's no reason you have to be miserable and live this lifestyle because we've been told you have. We've not only been brainwashed in health and nutrition, we've been brainwashed on how we're supposed to live. Oh, yeah. And yeah. No happen. question. Yeah. Where people yeah. are taught to be, we're taught to be, you know, good workers, but not to yeah. be independent minded, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the whole end of, there's a, I don't know if you've, um, if you ever have, if you've seen, there's so many podcasts out there. There's a guy, James Altucher, who has a mm -hmm. podcast and a number of books. And uh, he is a, uh, he's a, he's a multi, uh, multi talented dude who's uh, done some stuff in investments and writing. And uh, he's, uh, what he, what's cool about him is he's, he's been up and down a few times. He's made millions and lost it, and made millions and lost it. And yeah. he's super honest about it. But uh, anyway, his latest book is called Choose Yourself. And he, go, he goes deep like into this, this whole thing, man. I would encourage you to check it out. It's a great read. Uh, and um, he's uh, just brutally honest about himself well, and his own stuff, you know, and telling what he's, how he was, you know, most people, he says it's most people are ashamed of what they really want. You know, and they're so far disconnected, they're so disconnected that they're afraid to even say, you know, what it is, you know, whether they, whatever it might be. So, um, but I'm with no. you, you've got to get to that. Yeah, well, and that's a really good point. Um, that's what I'm known for too, and uh, I ruffle a lot of feathers because I'm brutally honest. And, you know, I'm older than they think. You know, I'm in my mid-40s, and I've, I've been around the world. I've worked some pretty stressful jobs. I've seen some things that no one will ever see. And my attitude is I just don't have time for the crap. Yeah. I don't got time for it anymore. So if you're going to waste my time, I don't got time for you. If you're going to be a pain in my ass in life, I don't have time for you. You know, and that's why I try and teach people. You know, if that's the way it's going to be, you have to make some hard decisions. And that's part of it is where we've been taught that if it's painful, don't do it. Sure. Make everything super comfortable and easy. And it's like that's not life. That is not how ancestral where we came from. Everyone thinks our life were brutally short, but it's been proven that actually we were pretty happy. When you look at primitive cultures, there's not very many anymore, but they're around. And when you, they study them, they realize, yeah, they don't have a car, they don't have a laptop, they don't have cable, you know, they don't have the Kardashians, they don't have all this stuff. And you know what? They're really, really happy. And it's kind of amazing when you make that thought process and this transformation. I bought 20 acres last year in a remote part of Washington. I'm building a house off the grid. Okay, and I'm I doing this and I about that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've wanted to do this for a long, long time. I probably started looking for this land about nine years ago. And it's very difficult to do. Anyone who's done it and um, I'm writing about it, I have it on my YouTube channel. I film everything I'm doing. Um, it's a long process. But it was something that I wanted to do because I want to have a place to get away. Sure. Um, people think I want to live off in a cave and not talk to anyone. I go, that's totally not it. It's more of just being able to hunt. I have, I'm able to hunt on my land. Um, you know, it's forest, so it's up in the mountains, it's in the trees. I have beautiful views. It's very relaxing. I can exercise. I can, you know, work out in nature. 
and work my land and my property, and it's so fulfilling and so much fun to do. Right. Because I grew up in a I grew up in a small town. I grew up in the mountains in California in a little small town, rural. So I grew up hunting and fishing. Sure. So I love that stuff, but I had to get away from it. I moved away and got into the working world, and all that stuff went out the window. And now I'm trying to get back in touch with it, but I'm planning. Again, that comes back to even getting healthy. You have to plan. You have yes. to have a plan in place. So I'm going through the steps and showing people how I'm doing it, and I'm making all kinds of mistakes. <laughs> you know, sure. It's not perfect, but that's the fun of it, too. Right. I don't know where it's going. Yeah. I don't know what the end result will be. But that's the beauty part of it. And you know what? In these communities that I belong to, um, I belong to some survivalist self-sufficiency communities. And just getting to know the people in my local area up there, they're so helpful. Oh, Everyone man. really wants to help. I mean, if I wanted to build the house and, and tell people, I'd have 10 people show up. And, and they'd be ready to help. And I think that's another thing that we've lost in society, too, is community. Yes. There's yes. no community anymore. Everyone wants to knock each other down a notch. You know, it's I got to get ahead of you because I've got to have a better car. I've got to have a bigger house. And I think people are starting to realize, though, if you see the trend, I don't know about in Spain, but over here, we have a lot of shows that are based on rural parts of Alaska, Washington, and the upper Northwest. And it's becoming very big. And people are starting to realize that what we've been told isn't necessarily true, you know? So that's why I'm doing it, and I'm going to have workshops up there. I plan to have uh, invite small groups of people up there and teach them what I did, show them the systems I put together as far as putting a well in, how I had to do the septic system, you know, because I'm doing it by code. I'm doing it a little differently than most people do. The shows you see, they just chop down some trees, put up a cabin, and they're good to go. Right. Well, that's not realistic. There's a lot of laws and regulations that you really should follow. And not only that, but you got to look at this as an investment. What happens if something happens to me and I can't stay at this property and I've built this squatter's paradise and I have to sell it? Right. That's a good, Yeah, good point. Good to think. You've got to look at it like a chess match. <laughs> yeah, because now if I have to sell it, I put this thing that someone has to knock down and start from scratch or I have to sell it to a person who's looking specifically for that exact same thing. Well, good luck. You know, so I made sure I'm permitting everything. I'm doing it by code, um, but it'll still be really cool. I mean, I'll still be completely off the grid using solar and wind, and it's it's exciting. I'm in I'm in my first year. I'm gonna go back up once it warms up because it's very cold up there right now. So I can't. The ground's frozen. You can't do anything. Sure. Um, so yeah, it's uh it's gonna be a project. It'll probably take me a couple more years, but people also think it's like I said. I use this as a perfect example. If you think you can go off the grid and do it real quickly because you've watched a show on TV, that's totally incorrect. Just like your health. Sure. You can, you can watch The Biggest Loser or whatever and that's fantasy. That is not how it really works in, in the real world. You know, so, so plan and have some patience, you know. That, well, speaking of, uh, congrat, con, well, congrats on your uh, off the grid project and it'll be great to hear more about that. Um, so, um, with that in mind, let's uh, let's change gears a little bit, and um, sure. I think people would be also very interested in your experience with the with the supplement world. You know, when you were working with as a special special agent with the FDA, and uh, was it was the FDA or was it the DEA or a little? It was both? the FDA. I mean, we worked with the DEA. Uh, uh, most people are saying most agencies we we were intertwined. Sure. So we all have to work together. We have our own little piece of the pie of far as statutes that we enforce. But everyone works together. We work with FBI, DEA, um, Immigration Customs Enforcement. Worked with multiple agencies. We all worked in task forces, and so we worked many different types of cases. And we would have our own. We would have to work with others who were in our office, other agencies. So you got a little bit of everything. But on the supplement world. It, it tied into a lot of, uh, actually my specialty was counterfeit drugs. Oh, um, fascinating. But that opened up a door to everything else. Um, I didn't realize how big the counterfeit pharmaceutical drug industry was. It's massive. Mm -hmm. It is massive and it's worldwide. I was investigating a worldwide network. And this stuff ends up in, in normal pharmaceutical stores. I mean, it ends up in your Walmart, CVS's, Target. Um, it's very hard to track. 
And that's why they've been against the drug industry has been fighting the, the ID chips in uh, all their bottles and in their uh, far as packages that they're shipping. Oh, because then they would actually you can track everything. It would be actually and, trackable, and they they would be on the hook for when they exactly. were exactly. <laughs> and not only that, but I found, and I will I. This is just me speaking freely. I don't have any evidence. I'm not going to go it, but. There is a relationship bef between counterfeit drugs and the drug industry. I'll just put it that way. I found that there was...